Part 2. The Philosophical Investigations uh, Wittgenstein, after writing the Tractatus, left philosophy, uh, having decided that he had nothing more to say. Why did he return to Cambridge and return to philosophy? Well, there are several levels, I think, on which one can answer that question. I mean, what he explicitly says is that he had come to realize that the Tractatus contained grave mistakes. And one of those mistakes was that the one that we discussed last time, the doctrine of independence. Elementary sentences are independent of each other. That was initially, when, when, he, when he came to realize that that was wrong, uh, and he wrote a little article called Some Remarks on Logical Form, which was published then, to recant on that view. That, it, that was the initial spur to bring him back to um, philosophizing. But I, I suspect that there were deeper reasons. I mean, he was a natural philosopher. He'd taken a long break and he felt that it was time to get back to business. How would you sum up the overall aim of the philosophical investigations? What's What's this book about, if you were to give it a, a synopsis? Well, at a very general level, I would say it's about the same thing as the Tractatus, namely how language bears on the world. What is the relationship between language and the world? To what extent is the world a product of language? Um, that's a very, very general characterization. Of course, once you descend down into the mist and fog of detail, there are a lot of differences. Um, but at, at at a general level, I think they're essentially trying to do the same thing. One of the most iconic quotes from the Philosophical Investigations reads as follows. For a large class of cases of the employment of the word meaning, though not for all, this word can be explained in this way. The meaning of the word is the use in the language. What does Wittgenstein mean by this? The meaning of a word is its use in the language. Well, he means that language is a public institution, broadly speaking. This is a point that um, he makes again and again in different ways in the investigation. It's um, language use is spread out over time, so that meaning should not be thought of as something instantaneous, but as something that arises from the use of words over time. So this idea that the meaning of a word is its use in language. In the Tractatus, we see that the words come first. They are what has meaning when they're constructed into a complex sentence. That's where the complex sentence has its meaning from. But in this sense, in the philosophical investigations, are we saying that the, the sentence comes first and the meaning of the words is contingent on how they're used within a sentence? Um, yes, we are saying that. But I just want to put in the rider that Again, I don't think that's very different from the Tractatus. So basically what you've, um, you've recapped there is the, the Fragian context principle, which says only in the context of a sentence does a word have meaning. That principle occurs in the investigations fairly early on, but it also was mentioned by Wittgenstein in the Tractatus. And uh, as I think I mentioned in the earlier podcast, uh, in the Tractatus too, the sentence is the primary unit of meaning. And words are an abstraction from sentences. So um, that seems to me not to be a point of difference between the Tractatus and the Investigations. What, what is a point of difference is that um, Wittgenstein is much more alive in the Investigations to an even wider context than the sentence, namely the context of the whole community and of its and its uses of language, the way it uses language. That plays very little role in the Tractatus. I don't think it plays no role at all, but it's it's certainly um, not emphasised in the Tractatus, let's put it that way, but it comes to be emphasised in the investigations. Language within the role of the community, then, this idea of language games comes out, doesn't it? What does Wittgenstein mean by language game? That's not an easy question to answer. I mean, he introduces the idea in connection with a particular description of a, what he calls a simple language game played by builders. Um, but he then goes on to use the notion of language game in lots of other contexts, and it gets extended, expanded, so that, for example, religious discourse or ethical discourse can be thought of as a language game. Um, basically, the idea of a language game is of some kind of relatively contained system Um in which things make sense in terms of that system, but there may be an external point of view from which they don't make sense or don't make the same sense as they make within the system. That's broadly speaking what the idea of a language game is. So 
would would an example of that be uh something like well one of the ones that gets gets used of like so if you take take a like the game of chess and have the pieces on the board and and the and people who understand the the context of what all these pieces are but if you remove the king from the board uh and and present it towards somebody who is not aware of how how this actually functions then the meaning of this word king doesn't actually have any meaning outside the the language game that you would be playing Yes, that, that, that would be right. And I, I think the Wittgenstein, I don't think he would say that chess itself was a language game, but certainly games in general, um, would count as a kind of language game because there are certain rules, there are certain ways of, of, of doing it. It's an institution game playing and you have to get into that institution to see the point of it. Quoting here from Wittgenstein, uh, 120 from the Philosophical Investigations part one, you say the point isn't the word but it's meaning, and you think of the meaning as a thing of the same kind as the word, though also different from the word. Here the word, there the meaning, the money, and the cow that you can buy with it. What's Wittgenstein getting at here? What he's getting at there is that he thinks that we shouldn't regard meaning as a kind of coordinate object with the word, an object set over against the word. Um, which is, as it were, its exchange value. That's where the um, economic analogy comes in. Um, uh, a cow is itself a form of money, and um, but it's also an object that you can point to. For Wittgenstein, we shouldn't think of meaning as being some kind of object that you, you can point to in that way. It's more like the institution of money itself, that's to say it's 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 a practice it's it's a, a system that we operate rather than an object almost a physical object that you can point to in the world and this this is to unpack the, the slogan that meaning is use meaning is use in the way that money is is use um so if we think of money in abstract terms as an institution not as bits of paper and coins mm. then the analogy says that um uh, we shouldn't think of of the meaning of uh, a word as its exchange value in some kind of uh, currency, but rather the whole institution of currency itself. That's the way the analogy works. The whole institution of buying and selling, which is a practice that extends over time and gets its point from its temporal dimension. Um, if you took a snapshot of a commercial transaction, that, you know, split second, that on itself wouldn't, that on its own would not make sense. It only makes sense as a commercial transaction if you put it in a wider context um, of the practices of a whole community over time. And Wittgenstein's saying, well, the same applies to meaning. Another quote here from uh, page 223. Uh, so if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. What's, what's Wittgenstein making this mark for? Well, there he's um, appealing to his idea of a form of life. That's a phrase that he uses um, several times. And his idea is that um, having a language and living a form of life are two interconnected things. Um, and the language only makes sense in the context of a particular form of life. That's what gives it its being. And his point with the lion is that a lion's form of life is so different from ours that if it did have a language, we simply wouldn't be able to translate it because there wouldn't be enough points of contact. There wouldn't be enough uh, things that we could identify with and understand um, in the lion's form of life that would give us a, a, an entry point into interpreting the language. That's, um, that's his claim. I mean, I actually think it's, it's clearly wrong. I mean, it's pretty obviously false to say that because in many, many fundamental respects, a lion's form of life is extremely similar to ours. It is a biological creature. It, 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 it has to feed. It has to sleep. It has to, um, mate. It has to excrete. It has to do all this, the, go through all the biological functions that, that we have to go through. And so there are very many points of reference in a lion's form of life that are immediately accessible to us. And if a lion did have a language, that language would perforce be about those aspects of the lion's life. And in fact, I mean, I think actually the reverse of what Wittgenstein says is true. If a lion did have a language, it would actually be pretty easy to interpret it for us because we're more complex beings uh, relative to the lion. And I think it would be a fairly simple language to interpret. 
got a couple of quotes here which uh, which I think are interesting in emphasizing this point. Uh, John Churchill saying, Who has not rubbed a dog's ears or scratched beneath a dog's chin? Our capacities for communication with dogs surely are rooted in their shared mammalian nature. Another one from Rowling who says, Both the lion and I have interest in eating, sleeping, sex, avoiding encroachments on our environment and so forth, about which we could make doubtless small talk. Now, it seems like Wittgenstein has got this wrong if this is what he means, but does this not fall into a passage of the philosophical investigations where he's talking i think a couple of lines before he's talking about this weird culture of people who um, they don't have the same human behaviors and they're very difficult to read so is there another interpretation we could pose here that perhaps Wittgenstein isn't saying that we wouldn't understand a line because it's culturally different maybe he's saying that it's just so we just can't read its behavior and I guess you'd have to adopt the view that Wittgenstein is uh, is very much a behaviorist in the investigations to take this line. But is there any alternate understanding which we can is can we save him from this criticism? I don't think so because because we do understand a lion's behavior. It's very easy to understand. There's no problem there. But um, I mean, it's not an isolated remark um, which we can simply discount. It connects with a lot of other remarks that Wittgenstein makes in his later writings where he tries to imagine alternative forms of life. For example, he has scenarios in which people use rulers that expand and contract arbitrarily and still do something that can be called measuring. Um, he has another scenario in which um, people sell wood according to the area it occupies on the ground. So if you take a pile of wood and spread it out over a larger area, these wood sellers say now it's more wood and costs more. And again, he wants to be able to say, well, they are buying and selling wood, but they're doing it in a fundamentally different way from our, from the way we do it. The problem that Wittgenstein faces with these examples and where I think his later approach is slightly naive is on the question of translation. Um, I mean, this is an irony, actually, because Wittgenstein is very much alive to issues surrounding translation, and he has inspired a lot of um, later work by Davidson and others on the problems of translation. But I think he himself rather ignores it. He tends to assume that we, as it were, sitting in our, in our philosophy seminar, can make sense of alternative forms of life, even though in practice we would not really be able to translate these other thinkers, because the, the form of life as described is so strange that um, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have the required entry points into their language to make sense of them, and then there is pressure. Then there would be pressure on us to say, and this is a point that Davidson makes explicit, that these people or beings aren't really speaking a language at all. If if we can't translate it, if we can't find any entry point into it, if we can't interpret them as rational beings doing broadly speaking the same sorts of things as we do and engaging in the same world, then what reason do we have to suppose that they're speaking a language at all? It might just be Twitters like birds. You know, it might might be completely meaningless noise. So Wittgenstein wants to occupy a rather awkward halfway house position in, in his later writings where we where we're entitled to say that there could be alternative forms of life, even though in practice we wouldn't actually be able to interpret or understand the language spoken by the beings in this other form of life. So we wouldn't in practice have a good reason to say that they were in fact speaking a language. So going back to the lion, if a lion could talk, we certainly could understand him. And if we couldn't, then we wouldn't have a reason to say that he was talking in the first place. That's the point that goes missing from that quote, I think. What is the private language argument and why is it significant? The private language argument occupies the central section of the investigations and it's really the cherry on top of the cake um, as far as the later Wittgenstein is concerned. It's in many ways the most interesting, most radical um, part of his work. And it has it has enormous significance. It might seem initially as, as though it were a rather small question. The question is whether someone could speak a language which nobody else understood. That would be uh, how Wittgenstein conceives of a private language argument. So we're defining the word private. It, it's, not, it's not the language that Robinson Crusoe speaks or that somebody um, speaks when they're on their own. This is a language which cannot be understood, logically cannot be understood by anyone else. Um, and he's concerned to attack that idea, show that it's incoherent. But 
the wider implication for that is really that in doing so, he unpicks the whole Cartesian subjectivist tradition about mind. So although it starts off as a, I mean, this in, in a way connects with your initial question about the interest uh, uh, of philosophy of language. Although it starts off as what looks like a rather picky question in the philosophy of language, it opens out into a very big question in the philosophy of mind, which is really the question what mind is, where it's located, to what extent the subject um, has uh infallible or specially privileged access to his own mind. Um, and the idea essentially is that if the Cartesian tradition were right, if the subject were in the first instance acquainted with his own mind and everything else came after that, so the world and other people's minds, that that came afterwards, if that were the right order of, of proceedings, then it would make sense for the subject to invent his own language, to speak about his own private sensations, his own private mental states, a language which nobody else could understand. That idea ought to make sense for Descartes, but it doesn't. So unwinding, the Cartesian position is wrong. That's a sort of broad thumbnail sketch of the mm. overall significance of it. So he would argue then that so if you had a like a, a very young child who's yet actually grasped the language of the culture they're in, uh, that that whatever inner monologue, if there even was one for for the, this child, could not be anything other than what they're already picking up from, say, their parents or the surrounding. There could there could be no truly private voice there. Is is that right in saying? Not private in this technical yeah. sense. That's to say, um, a language other people couldn't understand. He's not ruling out yeah. the possibility of of some genius coming along and inventing his or her own language and speaking it, but it would have to be a language that others could in principle interpret. So it would, it would have a relation to the, just the fundamental like structure of language. It would be comprehensible. Yes, it, and it would relate to the subject's environment, and that would be the way we would get our entry point to it. We would see how the subject was interacting with his or her environment, and that would um, give us our way into interpreting and understanding the language. Let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. My name is Jess. I'm a third year student here at NCH, which means I only have nine months left, which is really sad. I study philosophy with English, and I'm also the president of the student union. There are many ways you can get involved with the union. One is you can come to our meetings. We're always welcome to having guests. We actually really love it. You could join the events committee, which works alongside the events officer to plan everything that happens in NCH. Elections happen at the end of the first term, so you'll have had an entire term to settle in, to figure out where your place is in NCH, and then you can run for a position on the union yourself. Like many students, my first year at university was a bit of a challenge. I experienced some mental health difficulties. I started um, experiencing anxiety and had the occasional panic attack. And being at NCH, I received the most incredible support I could have ever wanted. My friends and my fellow students who I wasn't even that close to were always there for me. And the systems that we have in college are fantastic. Liberal arts inspired degrees in the humanities and social sciences. Gold standard teaching with one to one tutorials and small interactive seminars. Lectures by world renowned professors including A.C. Grayling, Daniel C. Dennett, and Steven Pinker. You can still apply directly to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pensycast. NCH London. Unique degrees for curious minds. The link to reach the new College of the Humanities is in our iTunes description and on our website. Right, back to the discussion. The notion of rule following is a particular point of scholarly interest. What is this idea of rule following and why should it be of interest to us? It's of interest because rule following is a fundamental part of our life and in particular it's a fundamental aspect of language use. When we use words, we use words with meanings, and we are there following rules. We're not just using the words randomly. We're using, in some sense, we're using words in accordance with their meaning. There is such a thing as correct use of language and incorrect use of language. 
Uh, and that distinction between correctness and incorrectness, that normative distinction, is essentially what Wittgenstein is exploring in the rule following considerations. He's trying to get at what exactly it is um, for a use of language to be correct or incorrect. Um, wh what is the standard that we're applying there which enables us to say that? Uh, and where does where does the whole idea of normativity, the whole idea of ideality, if you like, come from? What's its basis? What's its justification? So if language is uh, contextual or determined by our cultures and our abilities to play along in other people's language games, then we should abide by the rules that that we set out communally. Is that is this the idea that in order to have effective, meaningful language, we need to make sure we're following the rules? that that develop is this the right way to articulate it i think it's not quite that it's not so much i mean the way you put it it sounds like a piece of practical advice mm. which of course it is um if you, if you want to be understood you'd better play by the rules but it, he's not um so much saying that i think as asking more deeply what is it to play by the rules what what is it to use a word correctly or incorrectly and certainly as you say the community plays some role in his answer. It's been a big matter of dispute among commentators exactly what that role is. Some people have taken a rather, um, what I think of as simplistic line, according to which basically what the community says goes. The community is right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so using a word correctly is using it in the way that the rest of the community would use it. They, 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 are, they have the say-so on whether you're using a word correctly or not. Um, and the community itself is not subject to any standards. It's, it itself um, does not have to meet any standards of correctness. It can do whatever it likes, and it is the final arbiter on determining whether a word is being used correctly or not. Now, that's a position that some commentators have advanced, um, Kripke most famously. Um, it's There's got to be something right about it, because obviously, uh, and, and this connects with the point that meaning is use and use is extended over time. Ultimately, you might say, and over time, the community is the arbiter of correctness and incorrectness. So if a word's if a word comes to be used in a community in a certain way, then that simply becomes correct usage. Fine. But the, the, the sort of simple um, communitarian interpretation of Wittgenstein that you get sometimes in the secondary literature doesn't, I think, work because it, for the reason that, that I hinted at a minute ago, it doesn't allow the community itself to go wrong in any way. It doesn't make room for the idea that the community might not follow its own rules. It simply says, well, look, if the community says this is the way to do it, then that's the way to do it. It sets the rules. Now, as I say, in the long run, I think it does set the rules, but I don't think it sets it in the short run. So we can make sense of the idea that a community might, as a whole, go wrong in following a rule. It might make a mistake. That idea makes perfectly good sense, at least in the short run. And so that means that what it is to follow a rule can't simply be a matter of doing what if you ask them, the rest of the community should say, would say you ought to do. There has to be room for normativity at the level of the community itself and not just at the level of the individual rule follower. You mentioned Kripke a moment ago. If the, the meaning of a word is its use in language, I think this is right when Kripke uh, takes this to its end and uh, forms the sceptical problem that if the meaning of words is their use in sentences then does that mean that words themselves are meaningless? So does that mean that all of language is essentially meaningless if we take it to its end? Is this right? Well, you were, you were alluding there to the context principle again. The meaning of a word is it's, it's the way it's used, it's the way, it's the way it figures in a sentence. Mm. That doesn't mean that words in themselves are meaningless. It means, on the contrary, they're meaningful, but they get their meaning from their role in the sentence and their use in the language. Kripke's sceptical puzzle is not quite that. It's that um, he, the skeptic, crypti skeptic, um, wants us to point to a fact which constitutes our meaning one thing rather than another by a word and which justifies our meaning one thing by another by a word. So if we come to a new case, we've learned a word, we've used it in a certain way up till now, okay? We come to a new case, something we haven't encountered before, and the question is, does this word apply here? 
Um, and Kripke's skeptic is saying, well, um, what makes you sure that it applies in one way rather than another? Or what, uh, what, what, so what justifies you thinking it does apply correctly? And what does that actually mean? And of course, the skeptic thinks that you can't really point to any fact which would justify your um, using the word in one particular way rather than another. Uh, so to give a simple example, we've used the word blue up till now to refer to the color, which is uh, my folder here, which I have in front of me, is blue. But um, suppose we go into the next room and uh, there are various objects there, and I point to what you would call a green object, and I say, well, that's blue too. Um, and you say, no, no, that's not blue, that's green. Now, what is going on in that dispute? What makes one of us right and one of us wrong? And um, is it the case that one of us is right and one of us is wrong? Well, um, Kripke's skeptic says that there's, there's nothing you can point to in your past usage of the word blue, which would justify you applying it in one way rather than another. Maybe, to put it in sort of ordinary natural terms, maybe the way you've been using the word blue was such that it was supposed to start applying to green objects after a certain point in time blue objects up to time t and green objects thereafter. Maybe that's actually what the meaning of the word blue is and has always been. Is there anything in your past usage or in your mental states that you can point to which would rule that out? And the skeptic argues that there isn't. And I think indeed the various uh, facts that the skeptic considers, um, so facts about your past training, facts about your dispositions, facts about your the phenomenology of your mental state. These indeed don't determine meaning. I think the skeptic is right about that. And um, I think that Kripke's argument is pretty Wittgensteinian. Wittgensteinian. Wittgenstein himself spends a lot of time arguing against what was really the Lockean conception of meaning, that meaning is fixed by phenomenology, that it's fixed by um sensations, mental states that have a phenomenological quality to them. So part of Wittgenstein's polemic in the investigations is against that Lockean theory of meaning. But I don't think that Kripke's skeptic is right in, uh, or when I say right, I don't think Kripke's skeptic really represents Wittgenstein accurately when he says there is simply no fact of the matter about um, what your past usage would justify at this point. I think that Wittgenstein thinks there is a fact of the matter. Um, there are determinate meanings, and they do divide possible uses into correct and incorrect ones. Um, at some level, the community plays a role in setting up those determinate meanings, but it's not quite the simple connection that Kripke's uh, skeptical solution envisages it as being, namely that whatever the community says at time t goes for that time t. The com I think Wittgenstein is willing to allow that the community itself can go wrong. Do you have a, a like a, I mean, I guess we've had the colour, but is there is there an example that, because at colour there is more of a, I guess, a subjective nature to it, but is there a anything in which, in which a, you can think of where a community has decided upon something and then as you said almost broken the rules of how they have how they've decided to use a particular type of word or language okay well consider yeah. Kripke Kripke's own example is an arithmetical one so he imagines that you're performing a sum that is larger than any sum that you've ca um, uh, calculated before and he asks the question, or his skeptic asks the question, well, what makes one answer right and the other wrong? And what makes it the case that one answer accords with your meaning, with your intention, and the other not? Now, you could imagine a scenario in which the, there's a kind of a mass hallucinatory phenomenon or a mass madness in which the whole community is, is subjected to a drug um, and wakes up the next morning saying, well... Um, uh, five plus three is actually six. And that's what we've always meant by addition. That's a very small sum, of course. That's not larger than we've ever encountered before, but I'm making it simple. And in that situation, and maybe you, maybe you would have one person, one isolated person who'd somehow managed to escape this drug who said, no, no, guys, wait a minute. Five plus three is eight. That's addition. That's what we always meant by it. Now, if the rest of the community, everyone else in the world insisted that five plus three was six, According to the sort of Kripke, Kripke skeptical solution, that would have to count as the right answer. And this isolated individual would be, would simply be wrong. But 
I think intuitively we would say that that individual was actually right mm. and the rest of the community was wrong, at least in the short run. Of course, if the rest of the community persists and goes on, you know, day after day, year after year, saying, no, no, five plus three is six, then the meaning of the word plus would change to accord with the new usage and five plus three would indeed then become six in uh, in accordance with the, the new usage. But initially, the community would be wrong. Kripke's skeptic doesn't allow us to say that, but I think intuitively we want to say that. Well, I, I suppose with that, with that example, we have the issue that if, particularly with math, mathematical ideas, that the, to, have, to have the whole of the, like, that community disagree, like, surely you'd have the issue of just, well, if it's like a tautology, like, it, you couldn't... Sh- like, how... Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that at least you could, the person could argue a pretty good case as to why they as the individual were right and the community were wrong. But is there anything where it's perhaps less clear cut where like, <laughs> where they might not be able to do such a thing? The, the trouble is we, um, to make the example tractable, you have to use rather small numbers, where, as Kripke himself does. But if you, if you take a much larger sum, so a sum that no one has ever computed before, um, um, a very, very large sum indeed, um, then if one person came along and said, well, the answer is this, and the rest of the community said the answer is is that, what could either of them point to in in their past usage to justify um, their position? And that, in a sense, is Kripke's point. There isn't anything they could point to, and then, and then, and then the weight of numbers would simply k- kick in and the individual would be outnumbered. But um, si- sort of stepping back from it and, and, and considering that as a philosophical scenario, um, a thought experiment, I think we can see that there are circumstances in which we onlookers would say, well, actually, no, the individual is right. The individual is using the word plus in accordance with past usage here. Um, and it's the community that's gone wrong. And as I say, we can make that kind of scenario vivid by, I mean, here's a sort of more updated ver- version, the sort of Day of the Triffids version I gave you a minute ago. Just imagine, imagine some alien community managed to hack into our brains um, and altered the software so that we started using the word plus differently. But this alien community, by mistake, missed out one person, me, say. So I go on saying, look, uh, M plus N is, and I, I give what the community would have previously have given as its sum. Mm. But now the rest of the community, having had their brains tampered with, say, no, 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 it's not that, it's something else. Well, uh, as I say, in that situation, I think it makes sense to say that I'm right and they're all wrong. I'm using the word plus in accordance with its previous usage. But as, I, as I've mentioned, if, if their error persists, then it's, at some point it ceases to be an error, and we would say that the word plus has now changed its meaning. They, of course, would not accept that it's changed its meaning, but they would be wrong about that too. So what impact does this text have on religious and ethical language? Well, of course, um, Wittgenstein doesn't really discuss either religion or ethics in the investigations. They occasionally get mentioned. Um, he does have a... Um, an interesting parenthesis at one point where he, uh, the parenthesis reads, theology is grammar. And um, in remarks he, he makes elsewhere, we, not, not, in the, not published in the investigations, but um, in other forms, um, we know roughly what he means by this. He means that moves in, in a religious language game, if we can think of religion as a language game, are to be thought of as grammatical moves. That's to say that they're to be thought of setting as setting the terms in which one thinks about what happens in the world. So they set the parameters. In a sense, they're not themselves up for discussion, just as grammar is, in a sense, is not up for discussion. It's something that's just given. So that there's not much point in arguing about religion for Wittgenstein or ethical matters. These are Things that are in a way beyond argument because they they are they are features of the parameters of the whole game itself, and you you've either got to choose. I mean, you've got to choose either to participate in the game or not. But there aren't really rational considerations that would argue into argue you into doing one thing rather than the other. The 
language game in religion then it's still it's is it meaningful to play the language game within religion in the tractatus we spoke about how god talk was all ultimately it it was pointless in discussing it was beyond the limits of our world beyond the limits of our language now in the philosophical investigations is religious talk meaningful now is talking about god certainly within our within the limits of our language and world and yeah and, and just to perhaps unpack that for, for anybody studying the a level so if if let's say if we took took a catholic and then so they they go to to sunday mass and so suddenly words like eucharist and transubstantiation uh, and salvation and atonement and and all of these ideas when they're using them in this context with people like in their parish church is that in that context actually meaningful in, in in the way that they live their life yes i think the later wittgenstein would say that it is meaningful i mean what he says is that he himself can't really do anything with that sort of language so an example he gives is of the resurrection and for he said what he says is is roughly along the lines of uh for me the statement that christ has risen would function as a scientific statement and it's just false. He's dead and buried, he says. But we shouldn't, th but we shouldn't think of it as a scientific statement for people who are playing the game. For them, it has a different status. So that, um, uh, it it's not, it, uh, it's not functioning as, um, a statement would if, I mean, if you said, if you said, well, my, you know, my father, um, my father is dead, for example. And if I, if I then came along and said, Hey, I've, I've just seen my father. He's risen from the dead. Um, that would be taken, at least in most contexts, as a scientific statement. And people would think I'd gone crazy or something like that. But Wittgenstein's point is that, that is not how we should understand a statement like Christ is risen. It's not making a move in that particular game. It's making a move in a different game. So it's not a sort of, um, dry factual assertion about, uh, the um, coming to life again of um, a physical body after it is after it's after it's been brain dead. It's not that kind of statement. It's it's got a much more mystical significance to those who use it. Um, so that it's you can't really. So in a sense, there's no point in saying to a religious person, "Look, look, Christ had a had a body like everyone else. So when he died, that body decomposed." Um, that is not really engaging with what people mean when they say Christ is risen. If you well, just but if if say uh, a young Earth creationist takes takes kind of offence to that and says actually no, I'm of the belief that uh, there was a physical body and a physical resurrection, and that like I do see this to be scientific fact. Uh, uh, would Wittgenstein say then that this is no longer sort of within the realm of what the religious language game should really all be about? Uh, are they? overstepping a line there or is it, are they just misunderstanding what they believe to be science and that that's just the end of it yes i think he would um he would have very little time for that he would think that people who thought in that way were missing the point of religion i think i think he would see himself in his later work as in indeed in the tractatus in the earlier work he would see himself as offering religion a way out um, in the modern world, offering it an escape route, if you like, offering it a way in which it can carry on its business in slightly different terms from those in which, from the terms in which uh, it's been conceived to work in in the past, because obviously in the past, um, people would have agreed with your creationist and said, of, of course, this is scientific language. It's, it's absolutely literally true that Christ rose from the dead. Um, Wittgenstein is, is as it were saying, well, we can't say that any longer. That's ridiculous. But we don't have to jettison religious language because we can understand it in a different way. And effectively, that's what religious people are doing because they don't treat scientific evidence as relevant to, um, to their, uh, beliefs. I mean, a good example of that is the efficacy of prayer, I think. Um, you know, various people at Dawkins, people have conducted experiments on whether prayer is efficacious and found that it, 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 it's not. It's, you know, you don't have a better than, better than chance, um, like, there's no better than chance likelihood of a prayer's being answered. Um, if you say that, I mean, if you say that to a religious person and, and show them the evidence, they're simply not going to be impressed by that. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the point of prayer, although in prayer you do ask for things, 
that's not really the point of prayer to get what you ask for, at least for, I think Wittgenstein would say that's not the point of prayer for somebody who really understands religious language as it, as it should be understood. If they really think that you're asking for something in the sense in which you might ask a parent for something or an employer, then you're missing the whole point of religion. Does Wittgenstein still think he's solving all of the problems of philosophy in this later work as well? You were. That's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I think officially he would say, um, no, he's, he, what he, what he says is that he's, he's adopting a much more piecemeal approach. He's mm. trying to solve particular problems as they come up, uh, as they occur to him. But he does still have this very wide, overarching approach to philosophical problems. So that in a sense, I think he is tackling fundamental problems, um, on a big scale, um, even though he himself might disclaim that motive. I mean, the private language argument is a good case in point. Um, Wittgenstein officially adopts this quietist stance. He says, well, I, I, you know, you can't advance theses in philosophy because if you did, everyone would agree with them. But advancing a thesis is exactly what he does when he says there can't be a private language. And a lot of people have disagreed with that. So um, he is using philosophy in the way that he did before, and most people do, to advance particular positions which it's possible for other people to disagree with. Which I wanted to ask a follow-up question with with religion um, and, say, with ethical statements. So if, if we went back to the Tractatus, it would be seem hard to make any uh, clear, meaningful statements on ethical statements, let's say, with, uh, well, just because Wittgenstein would have experienced himself. So let's say the First World War, if it, that was a tragedy and that the, the deaths of millions of people uh, was wrong. Um, like, you could perhaps could not say anything meaningful about that. It, has, his, has his mind changed here? And, and like, would he adopt something just to say that of like a type of cultural relativism uh, within like a, a particular context there? Or is, or could he could he establish anything that's more uh, maybe objective uh, in, 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 in any way? No, I don't think he would go for cultural relativism. He did write a lecture on ethics, uh, which was delivered and which has been published um, in his later life. And that more or less carries on the the um, modest position of the Tractatus that um, you can't really make substantial statements about ethics. That's actually not what language is for. Um, if you if you try to say something ethical, you'll you'll come out with either falsity or nonsense. And I think that position continues really in his later thinking as well. It, it, I mean, it's hard to say because he doesn't. He doesn't really talk about ethics explicitly much at all in his in his later work, but um, it seems to me that something like the Tractarian position is still very much there. So e even within like a, a particular culture, when they're when they're discussing ethical arguments, for instance, they they are they like unlike religion where they could be having some sort of meaningful discussion uh, within that realm. Is that there's still nothing to be had there? Well, um, see, I don't, I, I'm not sure that he would agree that you can have a meaningful religious discussion. It depends what you mean by that. I mean, you can certainly have moves made within the religious language game, which makes sense to people who are playing that game, but don't really make sense or don't seem attractive at any rate to people who are outside the game. Um, and I think he would say, say broadly the same about ethical statements. To finish off then, uh, we've got a, well, there's a quite a long quote here from Russell, but I'm just going to pick out the, the kind of core of it. So he starts off by saying that I've not found in Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations anything that seemed to me interesting, and I do not understand why a whole school finds important wisdom in its pages. And he later goes on to say that the later Wittgenstein, on the contrary, seems to have grown tired of serious thinking and have to have invented a doctrine in which to make such an activity unnecessary in reference to, to the things in which he uh, earlier said in his earlier works that you had to pass over it in silence. It appears that Russell is basically f feeling like he's copped out a bit uh, and has, has gone to, to talk at length about things that he must remain silent upon. Um, so that fo the following questions are, um, why did Russell reject Wittgenstein's later work? And do we have good reason to reject Wittgenstein's work based on his criticisms. It's interesting that Wittgenstein himself uh, um, occasionally uh, thought the same. There's one place where he says something like, um, 
I, I sometimes think that I'm philosophizing with toothless gums, um, so that he had some sympathy for Russell's criticism. Russell, of course, objected to the piecemeal approach that the later Wittgenstein has. He doesn't seem to be trying to build up a grand metaphysical system, as the earlier Wittgenstein was, was doing. But Actually, I, I mean, I think that Russell simply didn't engage with and didn't understand the later Wittgenstein's work. Um, and although there's no metaphysical system building in a, in a kind of grand Leibnizian sense, there are, there's a continuation of engagement with profound problems and indeed with many of the same problems that the Tractatus was concerned with. Um, problem of falsity is, is a good example. That's a, that's a deep, old philosophical problem, which figures both in the Tractatus and in his later thinking, um, very centrally. The problem of necessity. What is necessity? Again, that figures both in his early and in his later thinking. So that he's still engaging with fundamental philosophical problems. And that's why A, Russell was wrong, and B, we should engage ourselves with his later work. Part three, further analysis and discussion. My first question, uh, why aren't we all followers of later Wittgenstein? Very good question. I think we should be. <laughs> uh, I don't agree with everything the later Wittgenstein said, of course, but um, I think the broad uh, trend of his later thought is right. And there's been, I mean, for a long time, it was very influential. When I, when I was receiving my philosophical education in the 80s, I guess, Wittgenstein was very much something that one had to engage with, that one was expected to engage with. That seems to have changed over the last couple of decades. Wittgenstein is now a figure in the history of philosophy whom you can either engage with or not as you like. And you're not considered to be philosophically ill-educated if you don't, um, as you certainly were when I was being taught. Um, and it, it's certainly the case that um, philosophy of mind in particular has really taken leave of Wittgenstein in a big way. It's very much gone back to the subjectivist Cartesian tradition that Wittgenstein was, was, was attempting to trounce. Um, and I think that's a very regrettable development. So yes, I think we should all be followers of the later Wittgenstein. So, if, so has later Wittgenstein in the investigations, has he solved the problems of philosophy of language conclusively? Is there anything more to be, to be said on the matter? Is this the final word and we should just accept his his word for it. Well, I mean, yes and no. Um, the the difficult <laughs> no, he hasn't solved all problems. Of course, there are other philosophical problems that he didn't discuss, and there's more to say. There's a lot more to say about the ones that he did discuss. And of course, there's a, there's the issue of um, getting out exactly what his position is. I mean, to some extent, we've skirted round that. Uh, we did a bit when we were talking about rule following. There are more realistic and less realistic interpretations of Wittgenstein on rule for following. To what extent is he a realist? To what extent is he an anti-realist? Um, he's not always consistent on, on these questions. So that actually working out what his position was, or at least what it was at, at certain stages in his life, is not that easy a matter. I think that he didn't really make enough of the context principle either in his earlier or later writings, I think that the context principle has enormous significance in philosophy of language and metaphysics. Um, and um, that the way it points is towards um, a certain kind of realism about uh, entities in the world which have often been attacked by anti-realists and nominalists. There's actually a, a, sl a slightly regrettable tendency, I think, in Wittgenstein's later thought uh, towards nominalism. Um, so we talked about the private language argument earlier. Uh, and of course, one of the things he's attacking there is the idea that sensations are private in the sense that they could be talked about in a private language. For him, sensations are public phenomena. Mind is a public phenomenon. It's available to other people just as it is to myself and to be talked about in a public language. But he sometimes tips over into... Um, questioning whether sensations really are proper objects, whether they really can be referred to. So he, he talks about the object and 
Yeah, he talks about the object and designation model of language and there, so the referential model of language, in other words. And there are passages where he seems to doubt whether that applies to all aspects of language. And that seems to me a mistaken tendency in his later thought. So I think there are certainly areas in the philosophy of language which can move on from Wittgenstein, yes. To what extent do you agree with Wittgenstein's early work? Well, as I said in the early discussion, I'm broadly sympathetic to the idea that um, language and reality stand in a mirroring relationship to one another. Th there are a number of details of the picture theory that I think are wrong, and in particular, Wittgenstein misses out the significance of syntax. Syntax is something that language has, but the world doesn't. That's a very significant difference between them, and so is not present in the mirroring relationship. But the idea that all words are names, and that um, combinations of names form sentences which are true or false, these sentences are mirrored on the ground in states of affairs or propositions, which are structured in broadly similar terms, in function argument terms, as Wittgenstein himself says in the Tractatus, that seems to me to be right and very important. So that's that's one thing that I take out of the Tractatus, although, as I say, um, a number of the details, the idea that um, names stand proxy for objects, which is part of the picture theory. I can't remember whether we mentioned that. We should have mentioned it if we didn't. Um, names, in some ways, stand in for objects in the sentence. That's got to be wrong. Um, um, you couldn't have a sentence composed of tables and chairs. Wittgenstein, at one point, implies that you could and that words are just a convenient tool standing in for tables and chairs. But in fact, that's not going to work. Um, language needs syntax. It, it can't be interpreted otherwise. Ass arrangements of objects don't say anything. Um, so, there, so there are certainly um, aspects of the picture theory which seem to me to go too far, but the broad structure, it seems to me, to be right. His later work in the philosophical investigations, I know we touched on this slightly at the end of part two, but how far, to what extent do you agree with, with his later work? Well, I, as I said before, I certainly agree that mind is a public phenomenon. It's not something that is in some, is, is sort of curtained away in some inner Cartesian space. And I think that's a very important insight of his later work. And that, correlatively, that language is a, a public phenomenon. That seems to me important. The rule following considerations also seem to me important, although I think one has to take them further than, than Wittgenstein himself does. I think one has to, um, if I can sort of summarize, um, one has to operate with a notion of the ideal um, if one is to understand normativity in a way in which I think Wittgenstein himself would have been uncomfortable with. Wittgenstein is uncomfortable in his later work with any notion of the ideal. Um, any kind of uh, platonic ideal is something that he seems to want to shy away from. And I, I think one can't if one is to understand normativity. So I think there are aspects of his later work that one needs to take further. I also think, as I mentioned a minute ago, that uh, one has to jettison the nominalism, which uh, pokes its head out now and then in his later writings. I think one has to think of all words as names of objects. These objects are all objects in as good a sense as anything is an object. Um, pains, sensations, they're not private objects, but they are objects, all right, and they can be referred to in language. Um, and I think, uh, so I think there's a certain amount of muddle in Wittgenstein's later thinking about um, language and privacy, but he's he's sort of set the the basic picture, uh, which I think we should follow. Yes, is this idea of the mind being a public phenomenon? It seems that people who who uh, we've looked at the hard problem of consciousness a few times, episode three nineteen and twenty five. Mm -hmm. It seems that there's this what is likeness mm -hmm. to being in my mind, and it doesn't seem like it's a public phenomenon. It seems like it's something private in my head. Does it not? So is it, are we justified in reject? What, what are the implications on that claim that the, so if we say the mind is a public phenomenon, what are the implications of that on the hard problem of consciousness? There is no hard problem of consciousness. It's a short <laughs> answer to that question. And if you, I actually have an article just coming out in mind on, on the idea of what it's likeness. Um, I think that the whole idea of what it's likeness has been completely misunderstood in the recent philosophy of mind, and that reading Wittgenstein can actually help us correct that error. So there are things that it is like to be in a particular mental state, but the notion of what it's likeness is a comparative notion, and we can say what it's like. So to give an example from Locke, for example, you might say that seeing a flash of brilliant red is like hearing the sound of a trumpet. 
that's what it's like. What philosophers of mind have meant, what they've wanted to get at, is some notion of what it's likeness that is not expressible in words, not expressible in public language, somehow, but something that I myself am acquainted with from my own case. Mm -hmm. And it's that whole idea that Wittgenstein unpicks. So you think the hard problem of consciousness, it's just a linguistic confusion to summarize your yes, position? Yes, exactly. Okay, we'll leave that there. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a, a nice way to yeah, leave that. To be fair, there was a lot of that discussion on the... Uh, yeah. Concluding remarks, I'd like to conclude um, with, I think it's we're looking at the value, not only the content of the text over this, the course of this discussion. We've continually raised the question, you know, if, so for the Tractatus, if this does not work, what's the value in studying it? And there's something self-fulfilling about reading these texts and figuring out uh, the implications of them, how we've just been doing, for example, with the private language arguments. And it seems that both texts go beyond the philosophy of language in so many different aspects. And it's not only a, a point of scholarly interest in doing it for its own sake, but it seems to tell us other truths about the world when we study them. I, I don't want to over, I don't want to ramble. I want to keep my point. <laughs> No, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank you, Richard, for for taking part in it. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I mean, I've, I'll keep mine short and sweet then. I, I quite like, um, and while I'll, I'll certainly want to be reading far more of Wittgenstein in the future, um, but just off the, the small amount that I have researched myself, I, I quite admire any philosopher that is prepared to look at where we draw the line um uh, i found it interesting you said that the the kind of debate has gone back to the like cartesian dualism uh earlier and and, and the fact that Pete, there seems to be this want in in philosophy and other areas where you kind of want to keep discussing these points that could just end up going on endless loops and almost having someone like wittgenstein to come in and say enough's enough <laughs> uh is sometimes quite nice uh, it almost resets things and i think philosophy can learn a lot from that message let us pause once again to hear from our fantastic sponsors the new college of the humanities i was born in canada and went to international schools uh, and i grew up in a few different countries which was an experience i really enjoyed and something that i'm enjoying about nch is the different people here but as soon as I heard the name New College of the Humanities, I knew it was something that might be interesting to me. The relationship that NCH had with me, even during the application process, was different from all the other universities. It reflects sort of um, values that NCH holds, making sure there's a good community and that people are having fun as well as like being really hardworking. AC Graying would come and do a few lectures and those are particularly enjoyable because he really knows what he's talking about and he always seems to get everyone really engaged in these stories that he's telling because he's, Anthony's just got that way about him. When I was applying to NCH, there's obviously uncertainty about what about what you're going to get because it's a new institution and it doesn't have the the sort of established reputation that some of the other universities I was applying to had. It's obviously a, a really big package that NCH is trying to deliver to students, and it comes off really well when you're telling someone about that as a pitch for university. But to see that it actually works in practice um, was definitely not surprising. But oh, this institution is actually doing everything that it set out that they were going to do. You can still apply directly or through UCAS to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pansycast. NCH London, unique degrees for curious minds. You can find the link to the new College of the Humanities on our website as well as in the iTunes description. Pop pop pop, 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 philosophy quiz. So it's called Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz, and we pick three different uh, scholars and the main scholar that we've looked at today. So we've got uh, we're playing Wit, Gan, Stein, Wittgenstein. So we've got quotes from Whitney Elizabeth Houston, the American singer, actress, and producer, and model. In 2009, the Guinness World Record cited her as the most awarded female act of all times. Uh, in the Gan, we've got uh, Gandhi, who lived between 1869 and 1948. It's good, not Gandhi. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we were stretching it. Uh, he's the leader of the Indian independence movement against the British rule. And we've got R.L. Stein, born in 1943. Uh, he's the author of hundreds of horror fiction novels, including the Goosebumps series. And finally, we've got Ludwig Wittgenstein, the Austrian-British philosopher of logic, mathematics, mind, and language. So you've got quotes from each 
Um, you can play, uh, we'll play like a, a communist version where you, you work together. We just, we're just going to try and guess. Okay. Just that's, trying. That's I'll give you a few. Okay. In a gentle way, you can shake the world. Uh, I'm going to go Whitney Houston. No. That's Gandhi. Not, that's Gandhi. That's one that we'll, we're going to change. We'll do, we'll do scores. Richard, one nil. Um, read, read, read. Just don't read one type of book. Read different books by various authors so that you develop different styles. That'll be R.L. Stein. Yeah, that's all right. That's one all. I finally face the fact that it isn't a crime not having friends. Being alone means you have fewer problems. Uh, you can't glance over at the screen. I'm, from I'm, the distance <laughs> over there. I'm not doing such I think that's your popular chanteurs. Uh, the, Whitney Houston. Oh, Whitney Houston. Yes, that is Whitney Houston. There we go. We have two yeah. one. Uh, we'll play first to three. Um, the world is all that is the case. <laughs> oh, there we go. To all and the decider. A man is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks he becomes. Uh, that's Gandhi. That's Gandhi. I'm sorry, Richard. You've been pipped to the post on the last <laughs> one. There. <laughs> it's not a quiz Fair you enough. want to win. It's not. A, it's also, not I think that. Like, uh, actually, wait. How, what's the direct quote there? Because I think G- Gandhi's misquoted saying like that thing. It's it's like a, there's no point uh, that I've. A man is but the products of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. Yeah, I think that's that might be the correct one. There's one there's one like It's one... from Goodreads. I mean, it's, <laughs> so it's gotta be It's right. gotta be reliable. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pan Psychast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It goes a long way in helping the show. Tweet us your thoughts at the Pan Psychast on Twitter. We're always eager to hear your thoughts on the show and suggestions for future episodes. All of the reading, including links to the Tractatus and the Philosophical Investigations, as well as links to Professor Gaskin's work, can be found at thepansidecast.com. Thank you. You've been listening to the voices of Mr. Jack Sides. If a lion could talk, we could not understand him. Professor Richard Gaskin. The agreement, the harmony of thought and reality, consists in this. If I say falsely that something is red, then for all that, it isn't red. And me, Andrew Horton. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence.